Hi, it's Robin. In Episode 5 of the Marvel Disney miniseries WandaVision, several Commodore 64 systems are featured in a scene. C64 appearances seem to be increasingly common in modern movies and TV, but this one was particularly interesting to me because they were used in a somewhat realistic way, with the famous blue boot screen featured prominently. But then as I rewatched the scene, I found many interesting details which differed from my Commodore experience, so I thought it'd be fun to go through pointing out each of these. We start off at Computational Services Incorporated sometime in the 1980s, probably around 1983 or 1984. It seems the company has just purchased new Commodore 64 computers for the office. Vision is still setting up his C64, and we first see him plugging the cable into his monitor. So let's take a look at some of these details. First, the monitor. They all appear to be model 1702 or perhaps 1701 monitors. Both models have the same case, and as far as I know, the main difference between them is just a different tube manufacturer. Vision is attaching the video cables to the back of the monitor, and he seems to be doing it exactly right. The top cable is white. That's for the audio. The left cable is yellow for Luma, and the right cable is red for the Chroma. Commerce 64 computers produce this separated or S video signal with the separate Luma and Chroma signals, which get combined inside the monitor. This produces a sharper display than a regular composite signal. And this is a precursor to S video that became common in the late 80s and into the 90s. Vision and Norm both seem to have authentic video cables, which you can identify with the long, separated, colored cables emerging from the single black cable. Their office mates in the back row seem to have just regular audio video cables like a stereo VCR would use. Perhaps the prop department could only locate two authentic cables, so they used them on the two computers closest to the camera. Looking at the back of the monitor, comparing my 1702 with those shown in Vision's office, we can see that the badges have been removed or covered over on the back of the monitors. Normally there it says Commodore, the model number, serial number, and so on. Maybe one was damaged, so they removed or covered up the badges on all of their monitors. Or maybe the busy, dense white text was too distracting for the camera, so they just covered it over. It's also interesting to note that their monitors appear to all have their doors that cover up the controls as does mine. That's actually quite rare. Those doors are easily damaged and fall off. We'll also notice that the Commodore badge is clearly visible on the front of the monitor. Now, looking at the computer itself, and if you're not familiar, the Commodore computer features a keyboard built into the computer, so it's one unit. The first thing we notice is that the power light is off, and then we notice that the system isn't even plugged in. There should be a power cable going into the right-hand side of the computer. Now, this was common even in Commodore's own marketing materials, so perhaps this was done deliberately as a bit of a nod to the marketing from those days. And we can just make out that the Commodore 64 badge is from a classic bread bin and not the modern The C64 remake. You can also notice that the shift lock key is down, which perhaps was done by accident. If it was done on purpose, unlike a caps lock key, the Commodore 64 shift lock shifts every character, including the numbers, the punctuation, and so on. It's actually very rarely useful for typing because of how it shifts all characters. We also notice that the computer is snugged up very close to the monitor, maybe so close that a modem or other accessory couldn't actually be plugged in back there. Now looking at the disk drive, we notice that there's a pencil holder in front of the disk drive, and that's pretty strange. I don't know if they were trying to cover up a fault in the disk drive, or they just really wanted to get that prop in the shot. We notice that all the computers have a disk storage box on top of each disk drive, that might not be a good place to store your disks, especially if the disk box gets pushed back over the cooling vents on the back of the 1541 disk drives. It looks like Vision has his box in the right spot, but over on Norm's computer, the vents are partly covered and it's in danger of overheating. 
We can notice on the back of the disk drives, they all have a power cable plugged in, but none of them have the IEC serial cable that runs from either of those two circular connectors on the back of the disk drive into the computer itself. This means that the computer and the disk drive cannot talk to each other, so nothing could actually be loaded from disk. And interestingly, both Vision and Norm keep their disk drives to the left of the monitor, while their office mates in the back row keep theirs to the right. I've never really cared which side of the computer the disk drive is on, but I've heard some people are very zealous about what side of the computer they think the disk drive should be on. It appears at the back of the room there's another Commodore 64 which belongs to the secretary or receptionist. Their desk is turned sideways next to the office entrance and we can see the blue Commodore 64 screen glowing throughout. As Vision walks to Norm's desk, the camera pans, and the blue screen is actually tearing, matching the movement of the camera. From this we can deduce that monitor actually is generating the blue screen, and the camera is capturing it, but slightly out of sync with the monitor refresh, causing that tearing. Now Vision asks Norm if they should surf the internet. What do you think, Norm? Should we surf the internet? Which actually wasn't a well-known phrase until later in the 1990s. Though apparently phrases like information surfing do go back into the 1980s. So this expression's out of place, but perhaps Vision is using it deliberately. Vision sits down at Norm's computer and we can hear him type a few characters and hit return. And then a screen full of binary appears. Also, right away, we can hear a modem dialing, and we'll get back to that shortly. The binary screen is formatted strangely. Usually binary data is shown in groups of four or eight bits, a nibble or a byte. In this case, it's in varying groups, seven digits, two, then four, four, six, and eight. And some of the groups are missing altogether. Is this a corrupted data stream? If we convert the binary in the top left corner to decimal, it's the number 81. And in ASCII, that's the character Q. The number below it converts to decimal 85, which is the character U. I was hopeful this would spell something, such as the name of Vision's brother-in-law, Quicksilver. But when I went to the third and fourth, it ended up being punctuation like an asterisk, a left parenthesis, and then other garbled letters. Unfortunately, I looked at this for quite a while and could not find any actual message here. The second, third, and fourth column across the top row, though, do convert to the numbers 2, 5, and 21, which could mean February 5th, 2021, which is the day that this episode was first released on Disney+. Plus. Online, I've seen some people theorize that the numbers down the left-hand side may be issue numbers of Avenger comic books that feature Scarlet Witch, Vision, and Quicksilver. And it's true that issues 81 and 85 do feature those characters. Moving on to the basic boot screen here, at first this looked very authentic and it was fantastic seeing this boot screen that I've known since I was a kid. However, on closer examination, it's not exactly the same. The most notable thing is that the word Commodore is removed from the top line. Perhaps they're worried about trademarks or IP. While they did leave the Commodore badge on the monitor, computer, and disk drive, perhaps that's different than when they're generating this video display as their own unique creation. I'm not an IP lawyer. I don't know. The other more subtle difference here is that while a regular Commodore 64 has a 40 column screen, this display only has 39 columns. They eliminated the extra space between the word system and 38911 bytes free. It seems whoever created this display is obsessed with centering, a luxury that we didn't have on a real Commodore 64 with an odd number of characters being centered on an even width display. And it also looks like there's only half a blank line above the 64 basic. The Commodore 64 display is grid-based, 40 characters across and 25 down, and the letters need to be placed in each of those grid locations. Unless you use a bitmap mode or other trickery, you can't put characters halfway through a row. 
It's also interesting to note that there seem to be accurate reflections in the monitor bezel, as if this display really is coming from this monitor. But we can also note that the top and the bottom borders are a bit smaller than normal. Next, the screen clears, and then strangely, the boot message is printed out again. That's not normal. Then the command load quote dollar sign quote comma eight appears. Now, normally this would load a disk directory, and then that command would be followed by list to see the files on the disk. To actually boot a program, which seems to be what's intended here, it should be load quote star quote comma eight or comma eight comma one, and then usually the run command. Also, these commands are normally typed in by the user, but we can't see or hear anyone type here. It's like this is all being automated. The next line actually has quite a few problems. First of all, this mode command isn't even a Commodore 64 command at all. It's actually an MS-DOS command, which sets communication port COM1 to 9600 baud with no parity, eight data bits, and one stop bit. This has additional problems. During the C64 era, modems were commonly 300 or 1200 baud, sometimes getting up to 2400 BPS, but 9600 BPS modems were very rare until the late 80s or even into the 90s. And additionally, the Commodore 64 required extra hardware to even use those new modems. So that speed isn't right. And this command only sets the COM port parameters. It doesn't even trigger a dial. Normally you would have to send a command like ATDT to the modem to actually dial a number. And for whatever reason, the modem already started dialing during the binary screen, not after this command. So it's all very confused. The dial-up sound that we heard earlier actually sounds more like a V34 modem, which is even newer. It's a 28.8K or maybe 33.6K modem. That was from around 1994. Maybe it does sound like a V32 modem. I don't know for sure. And finally, the screen ever so briefly says connecting just for a single frame and then instantly changes to connected. That is fast. This whole sequence doesn't seem to actually be played back the way I think whoever designed it, the prop people and so on, they probably didn't intend for it to be edited together in this way with the sounds out of sync and so on. But I don't know for sure. Now that it's connected, we get the message, one new electronic mail. This also looks authentic at first, but actually the OK and cancel options are centered incorrectly. They're offset by four pixels, half of an eight pixel character, both in the X and the Y axes. Again, the C64 is tile or grid based. And while it's possible to make the C64 print text in these other positions, I don't think that's the intention here at all, given that we're in this blue boot up screen, which appears to be a very basic type program. So we can see that the OK and cancel don't line up cleanly with the characters above and below them. And it appears that that one line is centered vertically in the space that should be two characters tall. Again, whoever made this really seems to be obsessed with perfect centering. And finally, we see the email. Asterisks are across the screen from border to border as they should be, except that's 39 characters across instead of 40. But the actual text of the email seems to be offset to the right, maybe two, three, four pixels, maybe half a character from the border. On a real C64, there would only be a one pixel gap on the left side between the border and the beginning of the text. Again, another change just to make it a little bit more perhaps readable or attractive to the eye. So that about wraps it up. I should add that buying Commodore 64s for your office in 1983 or whatever is a questionable choice for this computational services business. It's much more likely that they would have and should have bought IBM PCs or clones. But of course, I'm thrilled 
that they're putting Commodore 64s in here. And finally, just a shout out to the office mate in the back row. Look at him, he looks like he's thrilled to be sitting at a Commodore 64. I think there's a good chance that this actor grew up with a Commodore 64 and he's really excited to be sitting at one again. He's even got the disc box open. And look at him typing up a storm here with a big smile on his face. So this is a bit of a different video for me, but I was just so thrilled to see the Commodore 64 get such significant screen time here, especially a focus on the blue screen, on using the real Commodore font, and a good, if not perfect, attempt at recreating a genuine C64 experience in this show. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. Thank you to my patrons who support this channel, and thank you for watching. We'll talk to you next time.